if God exists, then why does pain, suffering, and evil exist? Have you ever asked that question? I'm sure you have. Why is there pain and suffering in the world if, if God also exists? Does God not care enough to take away the pain, suffering, and evil in the world? Is God not able to do that? This, this is one of the, the most difficult dilemmas that faces not just a Christian apologi apologist, but this is one of the most difficult dilemmas that faces us all. Reconciling the existence of pain, the existence of suffering and evil, with the existence of God. It's, it's a really difficult issue, and it's an issue that demands our attention, and it demands our thought. So how should we approach the problem of pain and suffering in this world? Well, the first thing, right off the bat, the first thing that we have to take note of is that this problem, it's unlike other problems that face the apologist. It's not, it's not a problem that's primarily historical or intellectual. It doesn't involve science. It doesn't involve archaeology. It's an issue that's not abstract. It's an issue that's deeply personal. It's intimate. And so when first talking to a person struggling with this issue, I think it's critically important to, to first listen, to listen pastorally, to listen lovingly, without immediately jumping to the easy answers. Easy answers are often false answers. And so just like what we, what we learned from, from the story of Job, what we really need to do is we just need to sit and to listen. So that's the first thing that I tell people when, when, we, when we talk about the problem of pain and suffering in the world is before you offer some sort of apologetic defense or argument, it's, it's critically important that you listen and that you love because these are, these are deeply personal issues. But eventually, we need to have the uh, apologetic conversation. Are there good responses that we could make explaining the existence of pain su and suffering in this world? And apologists have historically offered what are called theodicies. A theodicy is an attempt to reconcile the existence of God with the existence of pain, suffering, and evil in this world. That's what a theodicy is. And there are two prominent theodicies that are offered. One is called a free will theodicy. And a free will theodicy simply says that much of the evil and the pain and the suffering in this world is the consequence of, of men and women's free will choices against the good. What the free will theodicy says is that a world with evil in it is actually better from God's perspective than a world that doesn't include significantly free creatures. Let me say that again. A world with evil in it is better from God's perspective than a world without significantly free creatures. And God cannot guarantee that significantly free creatures will always do what is good. In fact, we know that they often do not do what is good. Without de he can't he can't guarantee that they that they won't do good without depriving them of their free will. And you know, one of the ways that I like to talk about um, uh, the significance of free will is if you think about a romantic comedy or a Hallmark holiday special. We know how these plots develop. They're all kind of the same plot line. Um, the, there's this long drawn out relationship. It usually starts with conflict where they don't really like each other. Then there's some sort of turning point in the story where they start to fall in love with each other. And then by the end of the story, they're, they're happily in love, usually happily married. They, they all follow this very predictable timeline, this very predictable plot. Now imagine, imagine your favorite romantic comedy. And the, the story has all unfolded. And in the last scene of, of the movie, in the last scene of the movie, the now husband walks up to his now wife and he kisses her on the forehead and he says, I love you so much. I'm so glad that you're my wife. I'm so glad that we have this relationship. I'm, I'm so glad that we had this story together. Kisses her on the forehead. And then he reaches back beyond her, behind her head and he flips a switch. 
all of a sudden that changes the entire dynamic of the story, doesn't it? You realize, well, maybe this whole story is a fraud. Maybe this whole story is a fake. They didn't, they didn't actually fall in love. This woman was just following her programming. That's all that was happening there. The woman didn't make the choice to fall in love with this man or to get married to this man. She was just following a carefully orchestrated program that she had been, that, that she had been given. And, and that, and so that's the essential nature of free will. God didn't want robots. God wanted a world full of significantly free creatures and significantly free creatures, unfortunately, are going to make many decisions, sinful decisions to reject the good. And so a lot of the pain and suffering in the world is the consequence of free will. Another theodicy that's often given is what's called a soul making. Theodicy. Now, by the way, these are not mutually exclusive theodicies. You could actually believe in both of these theodicies. Um, they don't contradict each other. A soul-making theodicy simply says that God uses the, the bad things that, that happen. He uses pain and he uses struggle in order to form us, in order to shape us into something different. And this, this really does fit within what Scripture tells us about the purpose of pain and suffering in this world. And I'm not going to read these Scriptures to you, but I am going to list them for you. And so if you're watching this at home, you can look up some of these Scriptures. Romans 5, 3 and 4. Romans 8, 18 to 24. Romans 8, 28 and 29. What Romans 8, 28 said, well, I'm going to come back to that here in a second. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13, James 1, 2 through 4, Hebrews 12, 7 through 11, and John 15, 2. Now, going back to Romans 8, 28 and 29, in Romans 8, 28, it says that God uses all things. He works all things for the good of those who love him, right? You've probably heard that verse before especially during times of struggle, during times of suffering, that God's going to use it. God's going to use it for your good. That's, that's a soul-making theodicy. Now, here's, here's the problem, though. We stop reading that text too early because Romans 8.28 does say that God's going to use this for the good, but Romans 8.29 says that the good is that we are conformed to the likeness of Christ. That's God's definition of good. So God uses the pain and suffering in our lives. If we let it, God uses that pain and suffering to shape us more into the likeness of Christ. That verse doesn't mean that everything is going to be happy. <laughs> it doesn't mean that all of our life is going to be easy. That's, that's far from what that verse is talking about. That verse is saying that God is going to use the things that happen to us to ultimately shape us into the likeness of Christ. That's what a soul-making theodicy says. So this, this theodicy, it seems to fit scripture. It also seems to fit our experience. Suffering is often the only thing in our lives that leads to significant growth. Without the suffering of exercise and physical labor, the body atrophies and dies. It's interesting to me that it's often the case that those who are never made to suffer anything in this world are often those who are the most miserable. So God's principle for our lives, his pr principal purpose, I should say, for our lives is not that we are happy. That's kind of a misconception that a lot of people live their lives by today, that God really, his number one purpose for my life is that he wants me to be happy. That's not, that's not what we read in scripture. God's principal purpose for our lives is that we be holy. And oftentimes struggle in our life is, is used for that purpose. So these are the two prominent theodicies, explanations for why pain and suffering exists. We've been given free will, and also many of these things that happen, they're used ultimately for, um, for our benefit. But there's some other things that I want you to keep in mind as well. Um, some things I want to end this session with. Here's the first thing that I want you to think about. Choosing to not believe in God because of pain and suffering does not remove the existence of pain and suffering. It only renders it meaningless. Let me say that again. Choosing to not believe in God because of the existence of pain and suffering in this world or in our lives, it does not fix 
the problem of pain and suffering. It only makes it more meaningless and more hopeless. Think about this. So um, someone that you love gets cancer, tragically gets cancer, and you pray and you pray and you pray. You pray for that person to be healed, but unfortunately the person isn't healed, the person dies. And so you say, well, you know what? God must not exist. If God existed, he would have healed this person of cancer. So I'm going to walk away from God. Now, here's my question. What, what benefit has that brought into your life? Has that actually made the pain go away? Has that fixed the problem of suffering in your life and the problem of suffering in this world? I would argue that it has not done that. It's actually made the problem of suffering so much worse because now you don't have any hope. Now you don't have any tools to deal with the existence of pain and suffering in your life because you've cut, you've cut off the source of hope that you might have. So the second thing that I want you to know is that we probably should admit that we don't have a God's eye perspective on the suffering of our lives. Here's, here's what happens when we're suffering. The only thing that we really know when we're suffering is that we're suffering. We know that we're miserable. We know that we're not happy. We know that we are um, anxious, concerned. Like all we know is what we're experiencing in the moment. But what we don't have is a God's eye perspective on, on our lives or on the world in order to make sense of that suffering. And here's the way that I illustrate this. I, I told you in the very first session that one of the events in my life that led me towards the study of apologetics was losing, uh, was a, tr a family tragedy. That tragedy was losing my sister in a car accident when I was in high school. Um, she was on her way to church. Um, she was in an accident. She died instantly. Several years ago, I had a good friend of mine. We were talking about the problem of pain and suffering. And he said, um, in the midst of that conversation, he said, imagine there's a red button on the table in front of you. And you could press that red button and the worst thing that ever happened to you, it never occurred. So in your case, your sister dying in a car accident, you press the button, that never happened. Would you press the button? Now, <clears throat> admittedly, the very first, the very first thought was, well, of course, you couldn't keep me from pressing the button. You, I mean, I would press the button so fast. But then you start to think about it. Well, what has happened in my life since my sister died in that car accident? Well, several different things, most of which I won't go into detail here, but I'll just say this. My, my sister's car accident started a chain of events in my life that ultimately led to me meeting my wife. I wouldn't have met my wife if, there, if this chain of events started at that, on that day where that accident occurred. I wouldn't have met my wife, which means I wouldn't have my kids. I also wouldn't have the career that I chose because of my sister's accident. My, my life took a completely different direction and I chose to go into uh, ministry eventually um, because of the events started uh, by that accident. Here's my point. If I press the button, all of the things in that chain disappear. Everything goes away. And so you start to think, well, would I press the button? I'm not sure now. Because from the vantage point that I have now, I see things in, a, in such a different way than I saw things on the day that I lost my sister. Now, is it still awful that I lost my sister? Of course. Of course. Is it still painful? Obviously. Of course. It's the worst thing that ever happened to me. But the only point that I'm trying to make is we don't always know exactly what the bigger picture and the bigger plan looks like. Here's the third and last thing. It's, it's critically important when we're talking about the existence of pain and suffering, especially as Christians, it's criti critically important to always remember that the central doctrine of Christianity is not the avoidance of suffering, but its ultimate defeat. The central doctrine of Christianity is about defeating evil and pain and stuff. That's what the cross is about. 
We don't run away from this problem. We lean into this problem. In the book of Job, one of my favorite passages on the problem of pain and suffering is in the book of Job, Job chapter 9, starting in verse 32. Job is complaining. He's complaining about God. Okay? He's complain he's angry about God in Job 9. And he says, "You know, God is not a mere mortal like me that I might answer him, that 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 we might confront each other in court." If only there were someone to mediate between us, someone to bring us together, someone to remove God's rod from me so that his terror would frighten me no more. Then I would speak up without fear of him. But as it now stands, I cannot. Job in his pain is crying out for a mediator to stand between him and God. He's, he says, I wish God understood me. I wish God understood my pain and my suffering and my anger and my alienation. I wish God understood. And do you realize that the complaint of Job, the prayer of Job, is answered in Jesus? The central, the central belief of our faith is that God wanted to fix the problem of pain, suffering, and evil so much that he took on flesh, dwelt among us, and sacrificed himself for our sins so that we could have hope. And that's good news. 